Greetings, everyone. I'm the Reverend Jill Olds, the director of the Youth Ministry Institute at Yale Divinity School. The YMI is very pleased to welcome all of you to today's webinar, our first for the fall, entitled The Emotional Intelligence Factor, How to Apply EI to Youth Ministry with Dr. David Caruso. This is our first gathering for this year's lecture series, which we've coined Thriving Not Surviving, building a toolkit for a flourishing youth ministry in 2021 to 2022. Just a word about that for a moment. For many of us, this past year has been one of youth ministry survival mode. There's a season for surviving, and there's also a season for thriving, for embracing life and joy and new tools in youth ministry. So as we enter this new season, this new school year, we're excited to be offering opportunities to hear from speakers who have done just that, who have figured out how to thrive. We will hear from folks about emotional intelligence. We'll hear about trauma. We'll hear about sacred story. We will hear about children's ministries. And for those who have engaged in anti-racism work with youth, each of our presenters this year brings a unique perspective and experience, and all of them hold a piece to the puzzle that will help us answer the question, how can my youth ministry not just survive, but actually thrive? We will be virtual for the fall, and our hope is to return to hybrid offerings with an in-person component in the spring, pending Yale's protocol for larger in-group gatherings. So please stay tuned as details unfold there. Welcome back to those of you who have joined us before, and a special welcome to all of you who are joining our community for the first time. We are so glad to have you with us. For our time today, Dr. Caruso will speak to us and we'll have some breakout room opportunities for questions and conversation. We'll then conclude with a final Q&A time. Please remain muted throughout the session, but there'll be time for more direct back and forth, so stay tuned for those. We will also be monitoring the chat window. So if you have a question, please feel free to type it there at any time. Our office has a great staff and I'd like to introduce them to you quickly and thank them for their work. The Yale Youth Ministry Institute falls under the purview of the Center for Continuing Education at YDS. So we have Kelly Morrissey, the Managing Director of the Center for Continuing Ed. And we're blessed to also have Megan Lukens, our Communications Coordinator. Thanks to both of you for all that you do, and more importantly, for who you are. If you are new to us, we invite you to peruse our website when you get a free chance. That's YaleYouthMinistryInstitute.org. You can find that in the chat. We have a whole array of resources on there. We have curricula for your youth. We have training modules for youth leaders. We have discussion forums. We have over a thousand video clips and lectures given by the world's leading youth ministry experts. We have COVID-19 era resources. We have tips for resilience with youth, resources for anti-racism work, resources to minister to the LGBTQ plus community. We have links to other articles and materials and all of that is available for free. So please do check out our website. We also want you to mark your calendars for some upcoming events. Our next offering for this school year will be on Wednesday, October 6th at noon. So same time, first Wednesday of the month, at which time we will welcome Dr. Su Hoi Lee. Dr. Lee is the Director of Counseling and Psychological Services at Phillips Exeter Academy. Her presentation will be called Grief. We all feel it, but do you know what to do with it? So please do consider joining us then on Wednesday, October 6th. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Caruso. Dr. David Caruso is a psychologist who develops and conducts emotional intelligence training around the world. David is the founder, the co-founder of Emotional Intelligence EI Skills Group, senior advisor to the Dean in Yale College and a research affiliate at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. He is the co-author of the Meyer Salove Caruso Emotional Intelligence Test and has provided training and assessment feedback to thousands of executives all over the globe. He is the co-author of several books. David and his wife, Nancy Spector, a child psycho clinical psychologist, are the parents of three children and four grandchildren. Raised in a Catholic family, David converted to Judaism after his marriage and raised their children in the Jewish faith. And back in the day, we are told that David coached 14 youth baseball teams, which utilized his skills in working with children and youth 
and he stepped down once actual baseball skills were required. Dr. Caruso, welcome. We are beyond honored to have you, and I'll let you take it away. Uh, thank you, Reverend Old, and thanks everybody for coming today. Yeah, it's um, yeah. When, when my some one of my children was eight years old, I went to these baseball games, and I just was appalled by the coaches, just the way they treated the players and the parents. And I figured I could do better than that, <clears throat> and I did for a couple of years until you actually needed to know like about baseball. So, um, but it was great. It was a great time. Um, Again, thank you for thank you for coming today. Uh, and as you heard, when you have a question uh, or a comment or say something that you disagree with, pop it into chat or, or just unmute and, and let me know. Um, let's not wait to the end. Uh, I think it's better to just let's address your questions and um, where I'm not clear. So I think it would be really super helpful. Like uh, like anybody doing this, I do have slides, and I do sort of realize, you know, I think it's funny sometimes we're talking about emotions, emotional intelligence. And how critical they are to our relationships. But I'm going to pop up, you know, PowerPoint slides, you know, in this, um, uh, which makes it a little more transactional. Which is why, you know, I really welcome the dialogue and why we also will try a breakout group. We get to talk to one another. In which case, uh, a little heads up. Just make sure that you know you're you're able then to turn your camera on at that point in time in, in those small groups. So uh, with that. Um, You you also you know this is being recorded or most of it is not when we get to the breakouts and um, so forth, but uh, you'll also have access to these uh, most of these slides. Uh, so just keep that in mind. That's I think that's kind of helpful as well. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it, it, in smaller groups or even in this large group, if it's something that's confidential and personal, um, please don't share it. But the whole idea is to share and apply the content. Okay. So I've been, I've been thinking a lot about this. Actually, let me just blank this for a second. Um, I, I, I've done these kinds of talks. No, I've done many talks over, around the world for you know, 25, 26 years, but not this kind. So I am both you know, honored to be here and honored to be asked to be here, but incredibly anxious about this, um, this one. Uh, I'm not a theologian. I'm not a youth minister. You know, what do I know about this? And as you'll soon see, um, you'll probably realize very little, uh, which is why I kind of need your help, right? You have to like, I, I think I know about these skills, but I don't know how to apply them in, in your world. So I'm going to really need your help and engagement on that. But I have been thinking a lot lately as a result of this talk. Um, like, Why do we have emotions? You know, because they, they just mess us up all the time. Why do they lead us astray? They... Um, So here's an example. This is being recorded and it will not be edited. But in my own haste, in my own higher level of anxiety than is ideal, I jumped ahead. So um, I always think anxiety is my friend, but sometimes it's not a good friend. So I apologize for that. that. But I would like you to all to go into the chat window and just could you, I, I'd love to know who you are. Um, in terms of you know what brings you here, or a few words about your own ministry, um, could you all do that? Like, and, I, and I'll do the same. So, um, uh, what do I actually say? Uh, psychologist trains EI. So that would be me. But um, again, go into chat and just please, like, why are you here? Basically, what do you do? What is your role? Anything you're willing to share? And we'll just give that a minute or so. Thanks. And if nobody does, oh, great, thank you. Oh. Thank you. And as you type in your background while you're here, just interesting, right? It's a really interesting group. Okay. Great. No. Great. Hmm. Wow. 
Okay. All right. Well, thank you. It's a pretty cool group, right? So it also says you're in you're in good company. Uh, so that's so thank you for that. Um, why do we have emotions? They lead us astray. So what? Why do we have these things? Um, they. Uh, why do Why do we get angry? Anger can be amazingly destructive. So why Why do we Why do we have anger? Why do we experience um, righteous anger? I mean, this anger not about harm to us, but about what's going on in our world. Um, why? I, you know, why do we feel pain or envy or, or grief or, or hatred? So destructive. Um, and I, would you give that up? Would you give up your emotions to get rid of that pain and grief and, and envy and, and hatred? But that would also mean giving up compassion and forgiveness and love. Um, I don't know. There are some days I might make that trade. Um, but I think in general, I would not. So as I said, you know, I have been thinking about this for, for, well, for, for decades, but more about why we have emotions in the last few weeks in preparation for being with you today. And, um, you know, we have emotions for a reason. What is that reason? If those who are here today believe that we are created um, in God's image, we have a really good reason to have emotions. I still don't know what that is sometimes, but we have a really good reason for it. And I think better understanding them, how they play out in our lives and in the lives of those that we minister to um, can be enormously helpful. The key for me and, and, and what I hope will, will be helpful to you is can we be more skilled and uh, you know, intelligent about how we process emotions because they're here for a really good reason if we can discover what that is. Um, what are those skills? Well, as you'll see, you know, we, 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 we see emotional intelligence as consisting of four related skills. Um, do you know how you feel? I know it's a pretty basic question, but a lot of times it's actually a really hard question to answer. How about the other person? Do you connect on a feelings level with other people? Do you match the feelings to the task? Do you know why you feel this way? If you're working with teens, do you know why that teenager who comes into your office or you're speaking with and they share with you what's going on in their lives? Do you actually get that? Sometimes it's really hard to do. Are you able to predict how someone might react? And probably, I don't know if it's the most important skill, is this ability to move our feelings, not suppress them, but to move them and intelligently manage them to achieve that outcome that we desire. This is our, uh, it's a really simple model. Um, but one of the ending points I wanna make is, it's super hard to do this at a high level of skill, on a consistent basis, in real time and under stressful conditions. Sitting here you know, on Zoom, this sounds really easy and it kind of looks it super hard to meet those four conditions. I don't, and I work at this really, really hard. Um, so we're gonna look at each of these in turn. Let's go back to our chat window. And this will illustrate our first skill. So now in a word or two, could you just tell me um, the answer to the question that you get asked probably a dozen times a day or ask it, how you doing? Um, so I'll start, I am fine. Uh, what about all of you? Hey, what's going on everybody? So give me a word or two, John, thank you. Okay, uh, Harry, Ooh, okay. Um, good, great. How, how's everybody else doing out there? Wherever you are, decent, well, excellent, terrific. 
Hungry but because sorry, I can't help you. Uh, curious, good, glad for the day. Okay, great. A little overwhelmed, sorry, exhausted. Well, relaxed, great, good. How else is everybody doing? What's happening out there? Bit overwhelmed, sorry, Derek. Interested, okay. Curious and hopeful. All right. All right. So here's uh, one of the things I would love for you to take away is how you ask this question and then listen for the answers. Oftentimes we don't, because here's, here's the typical set of responses. Um, and this group is a little less typical. So if you work with young children, teenagers, young adults, and you ask these questions, how are you doing? How was school today? What's, just, what's the response? It's a lot of this was fine. Okay, how was uh, geography, you know, geometry? Fine. Recess, okay. Um, now in the United States a lot, when you ask people uh, well, how they're doing, you get a lot of awesomes. Um, so the answers to this are kind of cultural, but for the most part, when you get these answers, what have you learned about that other person? Fine, okay, good, great, awesome. What does that actually mean? Do you know anything about what's going on? I kind of argue, no. I mean, how many times do you say you're doing great because you don't want to upset someone? Um, you know, you don't want to come in there and say, oh, well, you know, thank you. Uh, let's begin our counseling session, pastoral counseling session, or here's a, you know, Sunday school class of, you know, 25 children. Um, all right, everybody. Um, so Reverend David, is, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm actually deeply depressed right now. Um, and um, you know, the way I manage it is, is with excessive drinking. Um, all right, kids, how are you today? You probably don't want to share that with, uh, and, and I'm suggesting you don't, by the way. So we say we're good or we're great. Um, and we do that because it's not asked as a question. And I think also we just want to protect people from our own complex inner lives. Now think about this. Um, think about, uh, I used to ask people about a typical day. I don't think any of us have a typical day anymore. Um, but your lives are really complicated. You have a lot going on. And that means that every person you meet, every child, teenager, adult, family member, friend, colleague, peer that you meet has a lot going on. They have rich, inner, complex lives. You know, small things like, uh, hey, did you get your eight hours of sleep last night? Nah, you know, that's impacting you from the small things of life, even the so-called good news, a new job, yay. That's a stressor in your life to some of the more powerful endemic things in our society. You have a lot going on. So every person you meet, if you go to a supermarket and you're checking out, that person checking out your groceries, what's going on in their lives? Hey, how you doing today? Oh, fine, good. Maybe and maybe not. Now, one of the reasons we kind of say fine or okay, in addition to like, we don't really think it's a question, is what do we say? Well, I'm feeling, um, you know, um, um, sort of like, um, well, what? We lack the language. And, um, for, for decades, psychologists who study emotions have said all emotions can be put on two dimensions, how much energy you have, low to really high, and how pleasant you're feeling, really low to really high. And we sometimes somewhat arbitrarily divide this into, into these quadrants, and we put names of emotions into each. And in a little bit, um, we're going to ask you the, the how are you question. And we'll want a real answer. We'll put you in breakout groups to do that. So how are you really? In addition to just connecting, like, why do we ask this? Because it matters how you feel. Um, how you feel impacts how you think, how you decide, how you show up. And one of the many things I like about our approach is that um, 
Happiness is a wonderful emotion, but you can't always be happy. And we would say it's not helpful to be happy all the time. Um, if any of you were involved in social justice work, making this, you know, repairing the world as best you can, where does that come from? Probably many different places, but I'm a, I'm a, a fan in a way of both anxiety and anger, not anger that becomes destructive, but anger that you manage really, really well to fight injustice and to make this world a better place. Uh, we know early on that people not who are depressed, but a little sad, you're more likely to find errors in a document. You think about that in your own work. Um, so each of these emotions and general areas is helpful. So there's another aspect here, which, um, and this is about emotional empathy. Someone comes to you, uh, they've experienced a loss in their family, a death in their family. Um, do you want to connect with that person? You know, the answer is, I'm sure is yes. But it's like, hey, how you doing? Hey, what's happening? Oh, sorry about the death in your family. That's not connection. That's not emotional empathy. So do you provide comfort and solace to people? So matching the emotions to the task and matching those emotions to those people that you're working with and ministering to. It's a skill. Third skill. All right, and why exactly do you feel this way? What's happening and what might happen? That's called affective forecasting or an emotional what-if analysis. If I don't intervene here in the life of this teenager that I'm working with, it's going to end badly because he's spiraling out of control. Right now, he's just irritated and frustrated. But that train, the next stop on that train is anger and rage. And I've seen this happen before. I need to step in now. So the ability to predict the emotional future is really key in the work you do. And finally, it's um, how do you manage and move these emotions? They're always like shifting around. Um, for today, um, I don't need you to come with this unbounded, high energy, everything's great, joyous, happiness uh, feelings. Um, what would most help to maximize your engagement is to have that slightly lower energy, but pleasant. You'll be more reflective. You listen, you consider, huh, that's interesting. I want to think about it. Um, now, if you're in that upper right, high energy, pleasant quadrant, you might be brainstorming ideas, but you might be less kind of present in a way. Um, I know some people have expressed right now, they might be in that more frustrated quadrant. Um, I will work hard to maximize your engagement, but I need you to work with me as well. What can you do to put aside that for now, not to suppress it, but put it aside for the moment and let's be engaged. Otherwise we're, we're wasting your time and, and everybody's time. So engagement takes me and takes you. If, if this 90 minute session is of any value to you, it's because we've all worked together on it. So thank you for that. And that's the ability model of emotional intelligence. Uh, we'll see this a few times. How are you doing? Matching those feelings, connecting. Why do you feel this way? And how do we move these feelings to achieve our outcome? Uh, with that, here's what I'd like you to do. Uh, we're going to put you in a small group, just a couple other people. Um, and actually, hopefully, you don't know those people. That, that would be great. This will be random. And I'd like you to do the following. Uh, introduce yourself, um, as you did before in chat. And to the extent that you are willing, this is not being recorded, how actually are you doing? I mean, to have that open and honest conversation. But because you know what you do, and I don't, I don't have your training, I don't have your background. How do you, or can you ask this how are you question in your own ministry and get a decent answer? Like, what are you doing now that works? I can't tell you what works because I don't do what you do. You're going to know, and you can have that kind of peer support. So I'll give you an example. So for me right now, I am I'm really excited to be here. Um, uh, pretty tense and anxious as well, I have to say. Um, and today, not overwhelmed, but yesterday would have been overwhelmed. So that would be my introduction. And how do I do this? Um, I, I actually... I ask people, I, I, I come in there and I say, hey, how you doing today? Which is what I did at the beginning. It's like, what's happening today? How's it going? Tone matters, um, you know, or 
and I, and I sometimes I self-disclose like I'm, I'm happy to see you. It's just, it's been a tough day, but I'm happy to be here. So with that, I hope that's enough of instruction. How are you doing really? And how do you ask this question to get good answers? What's working for you to get a real answer? And we'll give you just a few minutes. Um, you know, Megan um, will, through the miracle of technology, will put you in those small groups and uh, give you about five minutes or so. All right, so we'll see you in about five minutes. And you'll get a warning as well with a countdown. So just uh, say, join now, stop and join. So if you can go do that, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you so much. And we'll give people a few seconds. Um, the rooms will automatically close. Oh, I should have mentioned if anyone, uh, if you are back, if you just have something you'd like to share or a question that works for you, that would be super helpful to think about that. I, I'll, I won't call on anyone though. And here we come. Good, great. You know, if you, if, if you want, you know, keep your camera on. I, you know, this is about people and how we feel in relationships. So um, feel free to do that. Good. And what I forgot to mention is somebody want to share, I mean, did you hear anything of interest, uh, not of a personal confidential nature, but are you able to ask this, how are you question um, and get a, an answer that's open and honest? Would someone like to share what you heard, either your own or what the people in your small group came up with? Um, if I can make a comment, um, my name's Jonathan. I was in a group with Micah, Rabbi Ellenson, and Therese. Uh, and uh, Rabbi Ellenson made a very good point. Often, if you will be the first one to share something of yourself uh, with others, it kind of opens the other people, the other person up to feeling comfortable enough to say something about themselves. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, um, self-disclosure. Anyone else, something that works? Yeah, I'm Debbie Mastroni Kenyon. And I just wanted to say too that, um, you know, tonight I'm starting, uh, we're doing a white privilege study in my church. And the uh, part of the curriculum is every week, someone has to share an experience through the lens of racism personally. And that helps with the dialogue. So, you know, what Jonathan just said about sharing something personal, um, but not, not getting it into like a counseling session either. So it's important. Thank you. To... Thanks, Anyone else? Um, I think that with us, part of the conversation was, and this is harder when you don't know kids yet, um, but if, but in knowing them sometimes um, in the same kind of way of sharing your own emotions or how you're doing first um, with any question, I think is a piece of um, knowing who to ask first, knowing how to get this, you know, picking who you start with mm -hmm. in the questions, um, because there are kids that are better able to answer. And I don't mean honestly, like the other is dishonest, um, but just answer more um, genuinely, more authentically, or have the confidence to be able to do that. And I have found that if, if you get one, then the rest of everybody can be honest with that. And, but if you don't, then every, it just, it picks which surface level, which level to go to. These are good points. Thank you. Yeah. Please. I see a hand, uh, Denise. Yeah. Oh, um, did, uh, uh, just uh, uh, as somebody did before, just who are you? I just, I, where, uh, it'd be just great to hear, uh, Denise, you are. Oh, I, um, Denise Terry, I do Sunday school at St. Thomas's Episcopal Church in New Haven. Mm -hmm. And um, in our group, we talked a lot about um, asking specific questions, like instead of saying, how are you feeling? Say, tell me something that you did at school today so that you get it at a more concrete level and then go to feelings after that. Nice. I suppose, how was school? Okay. Yeah, those are great. Good. So I really urge you to try these. Um, I know some of us worry about asking and, and then we, you know, a child, teenager, adult tells us, and what do we do with that? And we'll cover that in a little bit. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so what we'll do is, um, oh, a little background just because of, uh, you know, where we are. Um, 
And um, like uh, emotional intelligence is, uh, uh, was introduced in 1990, a little, a very, a little, very, you know, humble article in this journal by two psychologists, uh, Jack Mayer, John D. Jack Mayer, and Peter Salovey. Um, and didn't get much attention. There was a book a few years later, which really blasted it and marketed the heck out of it. Um, but in their work, um, they really see that emotions, in fact, Peter had a book called The Wisdom of Feelings. Where's the, what's the wisdom in our feelings? Um, and they've been doing this work for a while. Um, the basis for it, we'll go from theology to evolutionary biology, is that emotions are data. They send signals. So uh, when you're working with people or even primates, emotions are signaling something. So if you're you know, walking around uh, this evening around dusk and you come across that animal in the top middle with the red circle, what is, what is that animal signaling to you? Well, what would you do? What's the data point there? Could somebody let me know? Back off. <laughs> you, know, you want a piece of me? Yeah, yeah. So definitely back off. Now you, so you back off, you run away, you come, uh, turn the corner of another street and you come across this dog in the lower right in green. What is that dog signaling to you? or dog guardians out there, what, what, what is that? If you're at the dog park, what does that signal to you? Pet me or um, connect with me? Yeah, it's, it's called uh, uh, either submission and or a play bow. Um, so like, let's have fun, throw the ball. I'll, I'll chase it, I'll bring it back, or maybe not. Um, but I am friendly, I am not a threat. Um, I sometimes fantasize that I wish people were more like dogs. Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm just joking with you. So I'm, ah, I'm, I'm burying my teeth, but you know, I'm just, I'm not going to chomp down on you. It's just a joke. So, you know, don't just chill or no, what you said really, really angered me. And I bear the teeth. Like, you know, I think life would just be much simpler um, if we were more dog-like. So, uh, but this idea that emotions are signals, they're a form of data, which is why we need to attend to it. There's another aspect of this. Antonio Damasio is a brilliant neuroscientist. And unlike a lot of people who do emotions research, he says emotions can help us think. In the absence of emotions, you know, it, we, rationality breaks down. That's kind of almost the opposite of what we've been taught. And we'll explore more about that. Just very briefly, almost, you know, to establish like where this stuff comes from. Uh, Peter and Jack have worked, to, you know, with each other since 1990. Um, I got involved some years ago because I actually met Jack in graduate school at Case Western in Cleveland in 1979. So we're still you know, friends and colleagues. And then I, I went to Yale in, 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 uh, as a postdoc in 1983, and I met uh, a graduate student named Pete Salovey then. They met separately. They've connected. So it's been, yeah, um, I, I'm involved because it was just an early research interest of mine in grad school. But also it maintains you know, colleagues and friendships. So, and we've been able to publish a bunch of stuff too. Um, so I mentioned that and I have access to most of these articles if you're interested in any of those. Um, does it matter? Are we emotionally intelligent? You know, it's not a yes or no question, it's how much so. Very briefly, um, when we estimate our own skills, most of us are not very accurate um, in general about skills, more so with emotional intelligence. So just think about that. Like, What's the downside if I overestimate my skills? And just, just think about that uh, as we go forward. Very quickly, because I want to uh, really focus on uh, skill applications and building. Um, emotional intelligence is not the most important thing in the world. I know sometimes you hear that. It's like, it's just not true. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to you about that at some other point in time. Um, so, but here's where it matters. People higher in emotional intelligence engage in more pro-social behavior and they have better quality relationships. They're better at handling conflict. My guess is that in the work that you do, these kinds of outcomes are good things and pretty important as well. Um, so these skills are, are, are fairly helpful in, in everything that you do, especially if you're focused on relationships. So let's try this. Let's go ahead here. Um, does it matter how you feel? I'd say yes. Um, it's a really simple activity for you to match the emotion to the task or task to the emotion. 
what I'd like you to do is whatever you have next after this session, think about like, what is it? Like what's on my calendar next? In fact, why don't you all think about that for a moment? Just, just reflect like, okay, wait a minute, what's this next meeting or interaction or phone call or email? And then think about this. What's the ideal emotion to have for that task? And to help you figure this out, and you can use that little thing on the right, the little graph on the right. Um, well, actually, you know, right now, um, yeah, it's, it's really, it's, you know, it's this story of a, a teenager in, in, you know, in, in, in one of my Sunday schools is asked to speak to me. Um, uh, he's experienced a grandparent uh, passed away. All right, well, that's a high energy, high pleasantness. Hey man, cheer up. Probably not. Um, are there activities where you would wanna bring that, bring your A game? Are there times when you wanna inspire people? Is that the goal? Um, no, you don't have to do this, but if you don't, you're kind of just mailing it in. It's a bit of a waste of time, right? You've, all right, uh, counseling session, check, did it. Did it, did it, but did you do it well? Were you there? Were you present for that person? Um, I do this a lot, you know, in, when I'm running a meeting, I, I, look at the, um, I look at the agenda and what are we covering? And I, I, I intentionally try to set that tone and it's, it can be pretty subtle or not, or sometimes it's, I, you need to increase the energy level and get people to smile. And so I actually have a file on my laptop here, my desktop, um, with jokes that I tell, and they are awful and they're terrible. And I promise not to say, tell you any of those today. Um, but, you know, it's hard not to smile at that. So, um, yeah. So be ready with that. I think it's a really practical application to what you do. Um, cognitive empathy. This goes to that meaning of emotion. Why do you feel that way? And again, uh, someone you are working with, this child will say, I'm really mad. I'm really frustrated because I, I want to stay up late. But it's a school night. Well, why can't I stay up late? You probably hear that a lot. Or working with, uh, with teenagers in high school. Um, oh, I'm so bummed. Why are you bummed? Uh, I'm not going to get into any good college. Uh, how many times do you ask someone how they're feeling? And they tell you, and you're thinking, you got to be kidding. That's ridiculous. Or you don't agree. Um, we see parents do this all the time. Oh, don't worry about it. Or that's not important. Oh, that's not worth being angry about. I understand that as a parent. I did that occasionally, but I sort of caught myself. One of the most powerful phrases you can use is, I can see how you might feel that way. Because they do. You, you can't argue, well, you can, but it's, it's wrong to argue that you shouldn't be whatever. They feel that way. You're not going to win that argument and you shouldn't. And it's called validation. Some of you probably recognize some of these uh, from uh, a therapy called DBT. And we'll talk about that later. So this is another thing you can take away from today is this validation. It's enormously helpful. Um, well, once you validate, you validate, then investigate. This is really important, especially with adults. Um, I, I get pretty sloppy in my terms. We say feelings, emotions, moods. They're actually a little different. You can have a bad feeling about something, but it's either based on a mood, a kind of background noise, or something that happened, emotion. Like how many times... You know, have you heard someone say, I'm so angry and you know this person and they're usually angry. So you don't need to fill in the blank to say, I'm so angry, period. That's it. Um, or I'm, for me, my go-to phrase is, I'm really anxious. I shouldn't say about, I should just say, I'm really anxious, period, because that's how I'm wired. And I know that and I have to but consciously think about it. So we would say, don't go with your gut feel, go with your analyzed gut. And ask, like, well, all right, well, how would somebody else react? Like, is there, how reasonable is it? Am I accurate? You know, do I know the other person's intent? I'm thinking, that was a really hurtful thing for him to say to me. Well, 
That's how I interpret it, but do I know their intent? And I ask myself this all the time. Am I just in a bad mood today? Uh, and if I was feeling a little differently, would my interpretation change? Now, the answer isn't always yes. Um, the diagram on the right actually comes from uh, a training session I did years ago uh, with, a company, I, uh, with a company of uh, engineers, aerospace engineers. And they're basically all ex-military Air Force and mechanical and electrical uh, and aeronautical engineers. And this is the diagram these people came up with. And they called it signal to noise ratio. There's a sound there. There's a feeling there. But some of it is junk. It's noise. It's mood. Like I had too much caffeine this morning. And some of it's a signal. Because you know what that guy said to me? That was hurtful. And that was insulting. And so I, sh I am angry. And it's not just me. So validate and then investigate. Envy, um, that's a tough one. I also deal with this a lot. Um, you know, powerful emotion and does not serve us well. So what do you do with it? Um, those of you engaged in youth ministry, I mean, you, uh, yeah, social media is not our friend. Um, especially for certain ages, it can be just very destructive, you know, and you, so what do you say? I mean, people say, I can't believe, you know, she's going on vacation again, or this person has a perfect life, um, a perfect life. But here's the thing. Yeah, you see a a snapshot, a snap, almost literally a snapshot of that person's life. You don't see everything. And you know what? You cannot surgically remove that part of that individual's life and graft it onto you. You want that person's life? You would have to trade everything about you for your friends. Well, what does that mean? Well, you wouldn't have your parents or your family or your friends. I mean, you'd have theirs. And you fill in the blanks. And do you actually know what their life is like 24-7? And I think about this for myself a lot. And I realize, well, wow, I would give up my, my well, no, I'm not going to give up my family. Well, then you can't have their life. And I think it's, 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 it's very effective. And, and, and try this as well. Um, I would have to give up. Well, here, I'll stop my video for a second. Um, I'd have to give up them. Um, you know, these are... Two of my grandchildren. I'm not going to do that. I don't care how bad things are going, you know, or or the or the fact that you know that that your that your life looks so much better on Facebook. I'm not giving that up. It's a wonderful technique. It's a wonderful strategy. Um, so let's go into the fourth skill. I, I, d d does do any of you feel this way, that you have to be strong? Because if you're not strong, and if you don't keep it together, how can you help those you minister to? Is that, am I, does anybody feel that way? Even for family, I see some nods of heads. Um, I mean, I, I definitely feel that way, you know. But here's the problem. Um, the problem is how we do that. How do we stay strong? So we're going to do a little demonstration. Ah, we do a little demonstration. And here's the demonstration. Um, I'm going to ask for a few volunteers. What are you going to do? What, what are you volunteering for? First, you're going to leave your video on. And I'm going to show you some slides. And you're going to follow the instructions. So I need a couple of volunteers. Three or four would be great. Everyone else, you, you would turn your camera off and position your Zoom window so you can see uh, our volunteers. Let me give you an example of what we're doing. Uh, we need some people to be volunteer ministers and others will be congregants. If you are the minister, you'll put your camera on, you'll position your Zoom window to kind of get rid of the video so you can just see this entire screen. 
And then the rest of us are going to turn our cameras off and we're going to choose gallery view. So all we see are the, the couple of volunteers with, with their video on. So I need a couple of volunteers. Um, and if you do not want to volunteer, turn your video off now. Oh, please, I hope if everybody turns their video off, I'll be very, oh, this is great. Please, don't everybody turn your video off. Um, all right. Oh, great. All right, well, thank you so much. This is wonderful. This is actually perfect. So here's what we're doing. Um, those of you with video on, I'm gonna turn, actually, let me turn my, no, I'm gonna leave my video on. Um, position your Zoom window so you basically are seeing all the slides. And I'll show you, right? So you are our volunteer ministers who are on video, top to bottom, and just push everything else to the side. If you are a congregant, meaning your video is off, position your Zoom window. So basically it's, you're covering the slides and you only see uh, our volunteer ministers. And I'll give you a moment for that. And could our volunteer ministers just give me a nod of the head to, if you're ready to rock and roll on this? Yeah. All right. And ministers, um, were you going to watch the slides but show nothing? And the congregants just mentally take notes. Like, how is my minister or my rabbi feeling today? All right, let's begin the experiment now. Okay, could our volunteer minister, you can take yourself off mute. Um, now here's a question. Did anyone have a poor, we call it poor poker face. Uh, did anyone not have just a neutral expression of our volunteers? What would you say? I would say Debbie looks pretty happy. So that would be a failure of poker face. Um, okay, um, but not a failure in general. Um, I uh, clearly misunderstood the directions because I thought that first slide we were not supposed to <laughs> make a face and then the other ones we were supposed to react okay. to. Okay. So, um, so here's the question uh, for everybody. Um, if you have a poor poker face, what does that do when someone senses you're being cagey or not honest? I, I think it can really harm relationships. Um, like in a major way. Um, uh, yeah, many years ago when, when uh, uh, one of my children, I think he was nine, um, had a pretty tough time in my life. And I was home for a week um, and uh, Ethan gets off the bus. Daddy, daddy, how was your day? And, uh, you know, I'd never been more angry and depressed at the same time. What did I tell him, do you think? What would you have said to anybody? I'm fine. I'm good. I, I, almost my exact words. Yeah. Almost my exact words. Um, but I'm not a good liar or I don't have a great poker face. I used to think I did. 
And he just gave me that look like a nine-year-old gives you. And he just turned on his heels and walked into the door. I made a big mistake. Now, I shouldn't have said, you know, daddy is actually really depressed and very angry. It's just a, you know, sweetie, a, a tough day. I'm so happy to see you and I love you very much. But I didn't do that. So I would like you to think about our emotions playing out. If someone's in your office or talking to you. Will they pick up on the fact that what you're saying is not what you're feeling? Because emotions oftentimes leak. Be aware of that. Um, now, I know uh, many of you were, were watching our uh, volunteer ministers, but um, if if anyone were to have a poker face, oh, in spite of that, uh, our, our volunteers, how many jokes were there? Those of you who left your video on and were watching the, the jokes and cartoons, how many were there? Can you give me a guess? Uh, either unmute, it would be great, or put it in chat. 13. Okay. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. I think at 10. Okay. 13, we heard 10. There are eight. Interesting. Okay. Can anyone tell me what the eight jokes were in order? And why not? What, what were you doing? What was, what was happening so that you were, were, were not laughing? Maybe, please don't say you didn't find it funny. I was trying to focus on not laughing. I was right. trying to focus on keeping a straight face. All right, right. what else? Yeah, that, and, and it worked. I, I, it, that, that worked pretty well. So as a congregant, we were trying to watch the joke and the minister. Oh, okay. We were paying attention to two things. So, yeah. yeah. So here's the deal. Thank you. So most of us can't, I mean, we don't remember there were eight. And if you remember it eight, it's pretty difficult to get the sequence. Why is that? Um, because uh, this is the work of James Gross at Stanford, brilliant researcher, uh, great, best presenter I've ever seen. The more you suppress your emotions, the less cognitive resources you have to process other stuff. You're checked out. You're spaced out. I'm biting my lip. I'm thinking of something else. I'm not actually paying attention. So in youth ministry of all professions or activities, you're hearing things and you might not be, you may be trying to suppress your own reaction, which at times is totally appropriate. But just know that there is an amazing cost to that. You're not present. We talk about the power of listening, but that dissipates because it requires conscious cognitive resources, and those are limited. And again, I'm not saying don't ever suppress. Like for the rest of our session together, I want you to suppress. That's actually a joke. Um, but, you know, I, right? Uh, imagine a world where everyone just said what they were thinking all the time. Uh, that's not what we're looking for. There's a time to suppress. But if you are proud of this as your go-to strategy, well, I hear all these things, you know, as a, you know, as a pastor, as a rabbi, as a minister, as a uh, priest, uh, and I really, I don't show anything. There's times for that, but that should not be your go-to strategy. Um, and this happens all the time to most of us. It happens to me. Uh, I can be in a meeting where someone says, what I think is my internal dialogue is, huh, that is probably one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Um, but I have a little smile on my face and I'm going like this, uh, but I'm not verbalizing that. And meanwhile, you know, I realize, well, uh oh, somebody's asking me a question. What was the question? And so I say, um, hmm, let me think, of, could you rephrase that? The real answer would have been, I wasn't paying attention to anything you said because I was trying not to laugh. Uh, you know, so I, this has got to happen to you. Please say it happens to you as well, because it does to me. Thank you so much. Thanks for validating me. Um, so if this doesn't work as your go-to strategy, what's going to do it? Well, by the way, there's tons of things that don't work. And here's just a list of them. Um, one of my favorites is procrastination. And um, oh, and, and Kelly and Jill, I haven't spoken to you about this, but um, I'm happy to do a session on procrastination. I've been meaning to do it for years. I just simply haven't gotten to it. 
but um, but if you want to schedule that sometime in the future, again, that's a joke. Um, I said I had a list of jokes ready just to lighten the mood. I guess I need to work on that list. Anyway, these are all things that we do. And I'm not saying don't do it. It's hard not to. Um, but it's just important just to say these should not be our go-to strategies because they really don't work long-term. Short-term, they might. Absolutely. I'm not saying they don't. But these are not healthy strategies for us to adopt and work on. So what does? I'm going to give you a standard list. Um, these are long-term strategies and, the, and they reduce your set point, right? So, um, but you have to do these things. And what it means by reducing your set point is it just takes more stress to, to, to impact you in a negative way. You don't anger as easily. We, those are great outcomes. Now, I know you know this list and you've seen this thousands of times. But I think it's still important just to mention this. Um, and again, you have to do it. You can't say, yeah, I know exercise is important. Um, yeah, I worked out just, um, I think it was about three and a half years ago. It's great. It worked great. You can't do that. You have to somehow figure this out. Um, the last bit there is, um, I'm, I'm really sorry we're not in person. But I also am grateful for keeping us safe and so forth. Um, but this idea of socially distancing, I, I just, uh, please don't, I mean, my plea is that's a really bad idea because relationships are some of the most, the, a huge means of supporting ourselves and others. Now you can be physically distant and safe, but don't be socially distant. Um, how can you figure out how to make those connections? and treasure your friends and make new ones. And frankly, I think by having these kinds of conversations, it's one way to, to maintain those relationships and it's another way to create new relationships. I'm gonna give you a couple of more of these and then I'm gonna ask you for your strategies. Um, these are, so those are the long-term ones, but look, many of you will say, I'm too overwhelmed, too stressed, I have too much to do. Is there something else? Is there a quick fix? I, I have to say, I think there is. And these are self strategies. Um, this is not um, superstitious belief, but prepare. Oh, uh, what do you have this afternoon? I have a, a you know, I have a, this class I'm teaching about whatever, you know, uh, uh, church. Uh, what's the topic? Couldn't go wrong. It couldn't go badly. But what if it does? You know, what if there's a topic or a meeting that could go badly? So just, what if somebody has a a negative reaction to this, what would I do? And don't be surprised. Self-talk, um, but this is to yourself. So I find myself, uh, we have four dogs in our house and I walk the dogs a lot. And I have noticed that I'm actually doing self-talk but I'm saying it out loud. And I've gotten some strange looks from our neighbors, but so don't do it out loud. But I practice this in my head. Okay, I'm going here, modify the situation. When and where are you meeting? doesn't take more time. Modify your mood. It's not suppression, right? This is, um, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm really, um, I'm feeling very energetic today for this session, but let's say it was yesterday and I was just, I didn't sleep the night before, I was really tired. I would try to psych myself up because I owe it to you to engage. And I think you do that a lot. Reappraisal. Um, most of us act like jerks at times, but I think very few of us are. I love that difference, the, the difference that you don't know what that other person is experiencing. And so when they said that, um, did they actually mean it? And are they just having a bad day? So is it possible that I misinterpreted or this person is just acting out in ways that for, for reasons I don't know? Intervening moment, this is the, you know, count, or maybe not counting to 10, count, the, try one. Um, I do this, I just go, huh, take a breath and say, well, that's, that's all I need just to say something that's less dumb. And then, you know, if you're still virtual, using a headset, walking around. Give you another set of strategies. These are mostly directed at working with others. And as you can see in the bottom, this is adapted from DBT validation strategies. 
Um, I've been using this for years and only in the last few days in preparation for today, I reoriented these and really thought more deeply about the things that we could do. So showing interest is the, is the basic validation level. And that can be mostly nonverbal. Mm -hmm. um, where's your phone right now? I mean, not now, this is, uh, you, know, you know, but mine's over there and it's turned upside down. So I can't see if someone's, you know, getting in touch with me. When you're in a, a counseling session, removing the distractions. Okay, um, well, tell me more about that. So it sounds like these are showing interest on a verbal level and then hypothesizing. Now you may be totally wrong. So that's why it, it sounds like you're, I don't know, a little anxious about how people might react. I, is that because of what's, no, that's wrong. Or yeah, actually I think that's what's going on. And then the basic level of validation. Right, that's that. I can see how someone might feel that way. Expressing concern. All right, so I'm I'm here to help you. What do you want to do? What can I do to support you? An intervening moment, apologizing. Um, that's my go-to strategy because I still mess up in spite of all my practice at this, and I, and I recognize it. And it really is. Um, I just get very, you know disappointed with myself that I have to apologize again. Um, but I do, you know, because it's, it's, it's not the way I want to come across. That's not the person I want to be. And I tell that person what's going on. I'm, I'm really sorry. I don't say I'm sorry that you were offended. I am sorry for my actions and my words. And then the last level of validation is um, it's called shared experience or disclosure. And, and this was mentioned before. Um, when appropriate, and, you know, if done appropriately and, 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 and with some caution, um, uh, right, you can say, oh, I remember my first day of first grade. It wasn't, it was hard for me. I had to get on a bus and I didn't know any of the kids or, you know. Um, so this whole area of validation, um, it's very easy to do and it's very effective. Um, uh, so uh, our, our oldest uh, granddaughter is uh, turned five and uh, so in, when she was four and a half, uh, she welcomed into the world uh, a little brother. And what did most everybody say? Most everybody said, name is Miriam. Miriam, aren't you really, you have a little, you have a baby brother, you're a big sister, isn't it the greatest thing? And my, as you mentioned, as Jill mentioned, you know, my wife is a child clinical psychologist and that's my training. And we realized actually, no, that's a terrible event in the life of a four year, a half year old who had, Parents doting on her. And now there's this crying, poopy baby that everyone's paying attention to. Why would I be happy at something like that? So, you know, and we thought about this a lot, which is, but why do most children say how wonderful it is? Are you happy to be a big brother, big sister? Because all the adults around that individual are telling that child that you should be happy. Um, and I know we all, you know, we may do this and so forth, but I, I just I really found that it was interesting. And so uh, she would do family di diagrams and her little brother, Michael, was not in those diagrams or drawings. He is now, the cat was in there and Rosie the fish was in there, but not the little brother. It took several months and now he's appearing in, in those family diagrams. But again, I just mentioned this, which is, um, you know, and I, and I think what I told her is I remember, I have three brothers. Uh, my older brother is five years older. Um, you know, 60 years later, he still resents my birth, you know, because he was king of the, you know, king of the castle and I de dethroned him. So, and he's still as bossy as he was all those years ago. Um, so these are strategies that work. They're really effective, but you have to do them. Um, your challenge though, is this. Your challenge is, as I said before, actually exhibiting these skills in real time at this high level of skill, under stress and consistently. What I would like you to do is as follows. These skills, as I mentioned, apply to aerospace engineers. They apply to teachers. They apply to youth ministry. But I don't do what you do. I don't have your skills. I don't have your training. I don't have your experiences, but you do. So um, I would now like to put you back into groups of probably four or five, uh, Megan, so in a moment, um, and again, about five or six minutes, and to do the following. Think about these skills and about the topic. And 
how will you or how do you apply these skills in your ministry? You are the experts. I am not. And at the end, when we bring you back, I would very much appreciate uh, uh, a few folks to unmute and be, make sure you're on, you're on camera and share. Uh, what did you come up with? What will you do? What are those things you're going to try? Because just like exercise, knowing it kind of doesn't really help. Um, it's actually the application of these skills in real time. I am going to do this. Um, and I believe you can see my slides again. Great. And I'll show you why. Um, you'll have this. This is a list of a couple of videos and, and some books and things, some with those words. Um, again, you'll have access to this, so I won't linger on there. I always feel that's a bit of you know, a little crass sometimes to put that there, but I understand that some people sometimes ask for, for resources. I mentioned in one of our skills is matching the feeling, feeling, mood, or emotion to the task. And for today, for us, um, I'd like you to leave with feelings of pleasantness, be more reflective. How do I integrate this into my work? Um, what are some ideas that I, I got from my, my colleagues here on this call? Um, and I think, you know, even being just in that reflective, lower energy, but pleasant state is really helpful. However, there are times when you want to conclude, um, you know, Sunday school, uh, a service uh, with inspiration, where people walk out just feeling energized. Uh, we don't do a lot of that in our world today, but um, it's possible. So how do you do that? Well, um, I think we can make a joyful noise or at least listen to one. It's not a hymn, but it is a song. And I think it does sum up what we're all trying to do, to create an environment of love and compassion and a little respect for everybody for different feelings, for different views, uh, for different emotions. So we're going to end on a song. You have my email address. You'll get access to the slides. I really thank you for joining us today. I know you have a lot of other things you could be doing, and I'm deeply appreciative of that. Uh, and for those who, uh, for all of us, uh, and L'Shanat Tova, Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, may it be a sweeter, healthier, and happier New Year. We can all use that. So thank you again.